that's that's you know myopic would be an understatement. We see the ravages of climate change every day all around us. We see extreme weather happening all around us and uh, and here in Los Angeles so far we've been we've been quite lucky. Yes, we have extreme heat events mm-hmm. and people and people's lives are impacted, but in other places of the world what is happening as a result of climate change is that people's lives are destroyed. And it isn't just people. Um, you know, the earth, the earth isn't here just for human beings, right? So it's all of the, it's all of the animals that, that were, were massacred in the wildfires, wildfires uh, that occurred. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the loss of sea life as a result of what we're doing to, to our oceans. So the signs of urgency are all around us. And I think the other thing that's undeniable is that this is anthropogenic. Some people like to say, oh, these are just the cycles of nature. No. Uh, We know that ever since the Industrial Revolution and ever since the ever-burgeoning burning of fossil fuels, um, this, like, incessant amount of of carbon dioxide that we keep spitting out into the atmosphere, Mm -hmm. that this has enormously accelerated and intensified extreme climate events. So this is something uh, caused by human beings, and it's something that must be cured by human beings. And that that means recognizing the urgency, that means taking drastic action. I don't see that there is any way of denying the truth of that. And why do you think that California needs to be the leading state in this transition to sustainable energy? Um, And what effect does it even have if if other states don't follow? We could be doing as much as we want to to tackle climate change, but if Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, or any other state in in the USA doesn't take action, it's good for nothing. Yeah, um, I would respond in this way. First of all, what we have seen in the past is that is that initiatives started in California mm-hmm. do tend to spread across the nation. Uh, so, so in California, mm-hmm. this is the the fourth largest economy in the world. This is not just a state in the United States. This yeah. is an you know an important weight globally, and therefore, what we do here has an impact not only um, across the United States. But, but on the global stage. Now, I understand people who say, well, but our impact in terms of g- greenhouse gas emissions mm-hmm. is, is small compared to others. So why should we be the ones to be investing the money, energy, time, talent uh, in trying to cut our own green- greenhouse gas emissions when others may not follow? Yeah. But... I think the response to that is that that if we're able to prove that this can be done and that it can be done in a way that creates jobs, that spurs the economy, that attracts investment, that brings in capital, that brings in the private sector, if we can prove that, then I think that that is a model that others will follow. So... And, and also it's something that for us mm-hmm. can be of tremendous benefit here because, because in cutting greenhouse gas emissions, we also cut air pollution as well. So we've got many disadvantaged communities that have, that have traditionally suffered from pollution disproportionately. And therefore, in taking these steps, we also protect the environment and we also try to redress some of the injustices of the past. And I'm convinced that the eyes of the world are on California. And if and if and if as we undertake this experiment here mm-hmm. in terms of, of moving towards a zero carbon future, if we're able to show show that it succeeds, you know, we'll be able to lead the world. I firmly believe that. Well I think unfortunately so far it hasn't been shown yet. Right. Uh, California has one of the largest budget deficits. And I think a lot of the climate policies that have been implemented actually harm small businesses. 
Um, and, and I can talk about the policies that have been implemented. So what, what will it take to prove that it works? What do you think will happen in, in the next five, 10 years? How will you prove that it works? Yeah. Well, first, uh, let, let me say this. Um, with, in any kind of, of progress mm -hmm. that one undertakes, uh, one has to always remember those who are going to be left behind in the wake of that progress. So, so while me as an environmentalist and as somebody who is involved also in the business side mm -hmm. of the environmental movement, while we tout the benefits of this revolution that we're undertaking, um, we also have to remember uh, the people who will be affected by what we're doing. So, um, uh, for instance, I, you know, I believe that, that coal is a, is a pernicious fuel that has to be done away with. Um, but that doesn't mean that people who work in the coal industry should be victimized. Uh, we, have to, we have to take care of, of people whose jobs and livelihoods we're going to affect in yeah. terms of what we do. So the small businesses that, that you referred to that might be impacted, I, I, think, I, think, I think you're right. And so we can't just blindly push away, push forward with our revolution without, without thinking mm -hmm. of those folks. So, and there is a name for this. It's called a just transition, mm -hmm. right? So it's a way of, of hopefully taking uh, the, peop the younger people who are in those industries mm -hmm. and providing them with opportunities to retrain, mm -hmm. providing them with opportunities in the renewable energy, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, arena. And, uh, and folks who may not be willing to do that, to try to ma make sure that they um, are treated in a way that preserves their dignity, that thanks them for their service, and takes care of them monetarily. And yes, all of this requires an investment that we all have to make, mm -hmm. um, but an investment it is. That's mm -hmm. how we have to think about it. Many people uh, voted for Donald Trump because of his emphasis on oil and gas and the oil and gas sector. He revamped it during his uh, presidency. Um, and I spoke with a lot of those people in person. They're not some crazy, you know, Trump supporters. They support him because they know that he will keep their job in the oil and gas sector, which pays well. Um, so what do you say to those people that are afraid of losing their job in, and work in oil and gas industry? I, I would say to those people that I understand your fear. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I understand your fear, as I would have a fear of losing my job and my ability to, to, uh, to, uh, to take care of my family. I understand it very well. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I would I would want to reach out to those people and to say, look, we have to do this transition. We have to do this transition for the sake of your children, for the sake of your grandchildren, for the sake of the health of the planet, right? Um, and and uh, and therefore, listening to somebody who is engaging in fear mongering and demagoguery, and trying to tell you that you know that immigrants are going to take your jobs, or that or that the climate crisis is a hoax, listening to those messages is not going to help. What is going to help is having a clear-eyed, sober assessment of the crisis that we're in. And, uh, and, and, uh, and trying to come together in a way that takes care of the people who are working in the fossil fuel industry, who've served for many years. Yeah. They don't deserve to be left out, uh, you know, to be left behind. Uh, uh, and so, as I said earlier, we, we, have, to, we have to find a way to, to provide for them. Uh, really quick, David. So then they said that um, Andrew Yang was kind of like, uh, uh, the Trump supporters kind of hated the fact that they were being overlooked. And then when Yang came in and he talked about a universal basic income and that idea, and you can't just turn like coal miners into coders, like, did you have any opinions on him as a son of immigrants and what he was trying to do and his ideas? I think he was very overlooked by the Democratic Party when he was running for president at that time. Yeah, I, I won't comment on, on Andrew Yang's ideas, on this, on this idea of a universal minimum pay for, for everybody. Uh, I, think, I think it's, it's a seductive idea. Mm. Um, 
but but one has to one has to a think of where that money is going to come from, mm-hmm. you know, and how do you and how do you actually do that without having a redistribution of wealth? How do you do it without without mm-hmm. tax? They policy? do it with Alaska and oil. So they said that data is the oil of the twenty first century. So yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at, at any rate, I mean, you know, I, I think I, I think it's a it's an attractive idea, uh, but on the other hand, I also think that that you know that people need to work. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. uh, it's part of I think it's part of the human condition that that uh, there are also systems, collectivist systems, in which mm. people uh, feel that they don't have to work, in which we get rid of the profit motive. Mm. Uh, those systems have also been shown to fail. No. Especially in California, it's a big social welfare state. Well, I, I would I would argue <laughs> with that with that notion. Um, I, I come from from a communist country, yeah. so I'm very much against communism and socialism. Well, but are you, are you are you against any kind of of safety net? No, no. The, I think we should have a healthy safety net, but we shouldn't disincentivize people from working. I agree too. What universal basic income does, it sets a floor. So there's no nothing put in there that says if you work, you're not going to get the money. A lot of these welfare programs say that if you're above a certain level, we're not going to help you anymore. A universal basic income, I don't know if you're familiar, it's not a disincentive to not work. It just says this is your floor. And whatever you make that's more than that, you get to keep it. Whereas all the other welfare programs say if you make more than this, we're going to take these things away from you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So it's different. It's yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, won't, I won't comment on it. I, I do okay. know that at the time that it was floated, that it really didn't, um, mm. didn't get traction. But I, I okay. wanted to also address what, what Lucy said mm-hmm. uh, right now. I think uh, you know communist systems have been shown to fail. Do not work, yeah. <laughs> um, because because eliminating the individual profit motive, yeah, uh, uh, you know, leads to stagnation of of society. Yeah, right. You need you need to to have this to have an encouragement, this incentive for people to pursue personal wealth yeah. and interest. However. If that's all you have, that too is is a recipe for failure. The the question really becomes, at least in my experience, and this is, I believe, the essence of the role of government, which is how do you fashion a set of regulations and uh, and and a, and, a, and a societal structure that enables people and companies to pursue, you know, excellence for selfish purposes, right? innovation mm-hmm. invention yeah. and so on for 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 personal reward but at the same time make sure that they act in a way that is for the benefit of society that's that's a difficult balance to to strike but i think as an example talking about power mm-hmm. right i think I, I think that we've managed in california anyway to somehow strike that balance because we've seen the increase in renewable energy, right? And how was that done? I mean, how is it being done? It's being done with, an, with a whole bunch of tax incentives, as we've seen more recently with the Inflation Reduction Act, right? And then it's been done with a series of mandates, which is the RPS, or the Renewable Portfolio Standard, in which utilities are basically ordered to procure part of their portfolio of energy from renewable resources. You talked about government retraining, but a lot of these government retraining programs have like been like diploma mills or people just like got their degrees or their certificates and then they have nowhere to go. Andrew Yang looked at it today, he said it, it had like a zero to 15% success rate or at least so. So a lot of, there were a lot of like um, uh, miners in Kentucky who like took on one of these, this, these coding programs 
and it was like from the Obama administration and then it just like collapsed in the middle of it or something didn't come through. Like, what are we going to tell them? That's why I'm thinking that a UBI is a safer bet because sometimes like I took a retraining program at the YWCA right here in Hollywood and I learned like 3D printing. I learned all these things and then they still couldn't like get me a job at the other end of that. So, you know, these things are, you know, there are holes. So, yeah. Uh, I, 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 won't, I won't disagree with you. Are you supportive of subsidies? Subsidies For to businesses that are in the renewable space? Yes. Um, not, not forever, um, but, but in order to, so I, I think for instance, in the renewable energy space, um, we're, we're coming to the point where, mm -hmm. where, you know, where tax advantages and so on mm -hmm. um, may in time not be necessary. But for instance, mm -hmm. subsidies to people who are buying renewable, who are buying uh, electric vehicles? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, think, I, I think that's, it's very, very important to, uh, if, again, if, if we're going to, if we're going in our transportation, if we're going to move away from fossil fuels in the transportation industry and have people drive electric vehicles and cut our greenhouse gas emissions, then yes, we, we, we have to help people do that. Just like we have to build out the whole charging infrastructure. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we have to build cars that, are, that, are, that have much longer uh, uh, range um, so that we get rid of range anxiety. Yes, government must help do that. And part of that is helping financially. But then is it reasonable to punish people who have gas powered vehicles, given that most of the electricity that powers electric vehicles comes from natural gas anyways? Okay, well, this is this is you, you, you touch on you touch on a very important subject, which is, as I drive my Tesla, yeah. you know, and feel <laughs> feel good about which my one do Tesla. you have s or y yeah i have i have a model three model three yeah 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 so um so i i like i like my car a lot i don't i don't particularly like the head of the company that <laughs> that produces my car so very controversial so i like to say i i i you know i divorce the you gotta art. disattach <laughs> uh, you know i divorce the art from the artist <laughs> yeah you know, so I like the art, and the, but, and the artist may not may not be perfect. Um, so yeah, but I, but as I as I as I drive it, and I and I feel good about driving an electric vehicle, I also have to be very aware of the fact that that that's not any good if the power. Uh, you know, if that electricity comes from coal or comes from natural gas. Yeah. So yeah, so we have to. You know, this is this is a, that's why I called it a revolution. Yeah, yeah, you gotta go one step at a time. Yeah. So uh, many people don't know, but the LA Department of Water and Power is the nation's largest municipally owned utility. Uh, yeah. They don't pay attention to the water board or the power board. Most people don't even know it exists. Uh, but obviously, water accessibility and cleanliness and power affordability and is are one of the largest issues in California. And we have to pay attention to those. Um, so during your tenure, you put emphasis on more renewable energy sources. But when we look at power prices, they have shot up exponentially globally, right? Especially in California, um, as it tries to increase the transition to renewable energy. Um, what do you think is the cause of these power price increases? Some people say it is these climate policies, the, the transition to renewable that have led to the increase um just i have some statistics here um i think in california it is uh the average residential electricity rate is 30 cents per kilowatt hour the average rate across the u.s is 16.11 cents so it's almost twice as much w where where is that figure coming from this is cents? this is the official uh rates of residential electricity really because I I, um, I don't know, I would have to check it, mm -hmm. but I don't think that that is the current rate for LADWP customers. I think it's This may be from last year. I would have to check. M it may be from last year, and it may be, remember, in California, we've got the investor-owned utilities. Mm -hmm. 
such as you know Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric, um, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric, and because those are investor owned and they have shareholders, so they're private. Yes, okay. well, they're quasi private because they're highly regulated, uh -huh. but yet they're private entities in that they have shareholders and, and a corporate structure. Their rates tend to be higher mm -hmm. because they've got shareholders and they've got, you know, they have a return that they have to give to shareholders. The publicly owned utilities such as LADWP tend mm -hmm. to have short, uh, uh, lower rates. But I will say this, during, during my tenure, both uh, on the commission as vice president, as commission president, and, as, and then as general manager. At LADWP, we went from something like 3% renewables, right? That means like 97% coal and gas to, well, there 14. was some nuclear in there as well, about 10% nuclear, to 20% uh, by 2010 in a five-year period. And we did that without backbreaking rate increases. Oh, wow. And, and and even now, you know, if you if you go around and you ask people what is it that they are most concerned about, mm -hmm. right? Uh, most people will not say it's my utility rates. You know, they'll talk about inflation and so on. But I'm talking about Los Angeles now, because LA in LA, Los Angeles LADWP very much recognizes that it is a municipally owned utility, maybe the largest in the nation, yeah. but it is still municipally owned. That means that it is here to provide a social service. This is why during the pandemic, for instance, they adopted a policy that there would be no shutoffs for people who didn't pay their, pay their rents. This is why there's a lifeline rate, there's a low income rate, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of ways to try to help people. But again, having said all that, right, um, we're now kind of at the place where solar and wind and storage are, are, are approaching what we call grid parity, mm -hmm. right? Which means that they're not that much more expensive than coal and gas, okay? Uh, and, and that is, and I think you think we're already at grid parity. So, um, but, but with any investment that you're going to make, it's an investment. You know, you, you know, thinking about cost is very legitimate, yeah. very legitimate. We have to think about cost. But I like to say that if all we ever did was think about cost, we wouldn't get out of bed in the morning, right? If, right, when you, when you bought your very attractive blue T-shirt, Ariel, you made an investment decision. There you right? go. Well, my your shoes. <laughs> or when you when you bought your Apple computer, yeah. you made an investment decision. When I bought this suit, I did that. I think so UBI is also an investment decision, but yeah. You, I'm sorry? <laughs> I said I think UBI is also an investment decision, but that's another conversation. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when, when oil and gas will run out in 100 years or so. I, I think I, I think we should have another podcast just, on <laughs> just on universal yeah he's, basic he's so sold on UBI <laughs> <laughs> that too is an investment decision yes of course and that investment decision would would have a huge cost right and that's why for instance I think there were many people against it but it is and so if if you look at that if you look at UBI only from the point of view of the cost right you would say no. But if you think about it from the point of view of return on the cost, then you might have a different view. So, so when it comes to renewable energy, when it comes to all of the investments in water, for instance, and we haven't talked about wastewater recycling or, or capturing our rainfall or cleaning up our aquifers or, or, you know, or new building standards, all of these initiatives mm -hmm. will cost money. But, but you can't just look at that side of things, right? You've got to also understand that if we're going to have a secure water future in Los Angeles, yeah. we have to make those investments. So you got to look at the results of what have been the once you've made the investment. What what has it 
what what is what's the return like month by month year by year and stuff and if it shows good return then you continue the investment if it shows bad return then maybe you go to the drawing board and you kind of you know yes. go from there exactly right. yeah exactly. i mean your view just a few minutes ago was that the retraining that you had received which cost some money somewhere right that that inadequate that was not a, good a little bit in right your case. yeah correct so but but so it is so i mean i i have, I have this issue with people who only think about the cost so for instance this issue of recycling our wastewater right not treating it to a high degree mm -hmm. and just throwing it away in the and ocean. is wastewater um a anything coming out of the toilet the sink that's all wastewater that's all wastewater um now there are, you can you can treat some of it differently you can treat you can say that the water coming from your shower mm -hmm. right uh, or the or the water um, coming from your kitchen that that can be used perhaps within the home to be recycled because it's it doesn't have it doesn't have the elements that that you know that urine and, mm -hmm. and feces do um, but the kind of wastewater that goes to uh, wastewater treatment plants like Hyperion and others, yeah. that wastewater too can be, can today, under today's technology, it can be purified to the extent that it can be, Drinking. that it can be, that it is potable. There's no doubt about it. I've actually, actually Orange County, the Orange County um, Water District is heavily dependent on treated wastewater, um, and they and they they, mm -hmm. they they take the wastewater. They they put it through membrane uh, technologies, they uh, uh, UV filtration, all kinds of steps to clean it. And then in their in their case, they put it on spreading grounds where it can filter through the soil for additional cleansing. And re and uh, to replenish groundwater, mm -hmm. and then it's extracted, treated again, and served it. I mean, I've drank that water; it's perfectly healthy. And what percentage of was wastewater is recycled here in LA? It's a small percentage here, and uh, uh, and in comparison, for instance, to Israel, mm -hmm. where eighty to ninety percent of their wastewater is recycled, or Singapore, or other places in the world. Yeah, Israel is a big leader in innovations and science and tech and everything like that. So it's good. There's like a special relationship between not just U.S. and Israel, but California. And why why is it that such a small percentage is recycled? Is it cost? Is it accessibility? Yeah, I think I in in L.A. you have to you have to understand its relationship with water historically, mm -hmm. and uh, so so Los Angeles could probably be home to maybe half a million people in terms of the amount of groundwater that we have. Um, we're now four million uh, in, in the city of Los Angeles, wow. 11 million in LA County and, and so. And so therefore, a lot of our water mm -hmm. is imported. From it's where? In, uh, it's important from the Owens Valley area, um, which is a, yeah. the most famous story about how water ever came to LA. Mm -hmm. It's imported from another aqueduct called the State Water Project, which is the kind of um, the San Joaquin Valley area, Sacramento Delta area, and it's important for imported from the Colorado River, right? So that was all great, while yeah. that water was plentiful, and it was dirt cheap, right? You could just build these aqueducts and bring the water in. Mm -hmm. Um, and for many, many years, we, the city of Los Angeles, thrived in that. But with the advent of climate change and with other demands on that water, mm -hmm. like Colorado River also serves Nevada, Arizona, tribes, right? I know there's been some fighting over Colorado River. Yes, and not for the first time. Yeah. Um, so, so, and also... With climate change, those sources are both no longer plentiful and they're no longer cheap. And they're, they're unpredictable. And therefore, the city of Los Angeles and many other cities such as Los Angeles mm -hmm. 
we have to move towards self-sufficiency. Yeah. We have to. And that means conserving more. It means recycling our wastewater. It means uh, capturing more of our rainfall. Mm -hmm. We had this tremendous amount of rainfall. Yeah. Most of it ran off to the ocean. So it means building differently in the future so that we conserve more of, more of our water. How do you capture rainfall? What does it look like? There, there, there are, okay. What, what has happened is, is, that, is that as we've urbanized, as we've grown, we've added more and more uh, asphalt, more concrete, more rooftops. Right. And therefore, therefore we have, by, and by doing that, we have distorted the balance of nature so that the water that would normally have seeped into the soil and replenished groundwater mm -hmm. can no longer do that. It can only run off. And when mm -hmm. it runs off, it carries with it all of the detritus, all of the garbage of society that's left on the streets, yeah. carries all of that to the ocean and contaminates the ocean and the coast in the bargain. So it's like a, it's like a double, there's like a double whammy My uh, God. You know, problem. Yeah. So, so we have to, we have to build these projects where more of the rainfall can be, can be retained. And they're called stormwater capture projects. And, uh, and they're happening. Mm -hmm. um, some of us would like to have to see them happen with more rapidity, but they're happening. And, and just so, just to add to this, back in 2018, the people of Los Angeles County voted for a measure called Measure W mm -hmm. for water, Measure W. And in voting for Measure W, they, they voted to tax themselves, right, in order to have a fund for water projects. That fund for water projects infuses something like $280 million mm -hmm. every year into for stormwater capture projects. So good for them. That's amazing. Yeah. An investment. <laughs> it was good investment, right? Now now that thing, the whole measure W apparatus is quite complicated as to how that's done in order to build accountability mm -hmm. and scrutiny and, and all of that, make sure that the the money is being properly used. Um but but they're just going through what's called the biennial biennial review process right now to see what can be done to even yeah. improve things. So there's three things that I picked up. Uh, preserving rainfall water, recapturing rainfall water, recycling wastewater, and then conservation. And cleaning up aquifers, aquifer remediation. Cleaning up aqueducts? Aquifers. Aquifers. Okay. All right. Is that? The, all right. So, so underneath us, not here, but say, you know the San Fernando Valley? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, underneath the San Fernando Valley is a huge groundwater aquifer. Mm -hmm. It's like an underground reservoir. Mm -hmm. right? It's like a sponge. Right? And, and we get something like 10% of our water from that aquifer. But many, many years ago, like during the Second World War and, you know, in the, in the heyday of the aerospace, you know, industry, mm -hmm. There was, there was a lot of contamination that was produced and it was allowed to seep into the ground, groundwater and contaminated the groundwater. So, so now we have, to, we, have to, we have to clean it up. Mm -hmm. It's called aquifer remediation and it's something that we have to do. And that's another investment that we have to make. Um, so there's, there's that. And then, and then the next thing that I would kind of Em emphasize is um, is uh, uh, refining building standards. Yeah. So as we build new buildings, we make water conservation ever more a, a part of an integral part of building design. Now we've done that mm -hmm. to to a large extent. I mean, each time each time you go into a toilet area, you'll see a urinal, and you'll see that it's a waterless urinal. Well. That a waterless urinal. Yeah, no water. I see it all the really? time, but the the only way the water comes is when you flush it. So 
Yeah. Yeah, and and <laughs> and actually, yeah, and many of them, it's waterless altogether. Just there's no not, water. They're not even a flush. Not even a no. flush. And then you haven't can recycle seen, the pee. Haven't seen those before. <laughs> yeah, you can, yeah, that's right. Exactly, you can recycle the pee. Look, otherwise, let me tell you what is <laughs> happening now. Just listen to mm. me, okay? Mm. There is ocean desalination, right? Yeah. People say desalt the ocean, and I, I understand that. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive. It's very energy intensive, but, but yes, it's done. It's done in Israel, mm -hmm. you know, and other places as well. But here in L.A., we treat our wastewater to what's called the secondary level. That's a very high level of treatment. Mm -hmm. And then we dump it in the ocean, right? To me, it doesn't make any sense to spend all of that money, recycle our, our waste, treat our wastewater to such a high degree, chuck it in the ocean, and then do what? Suck it all back up again to take the salt Diesel. out of it? Yeah. Rather than do that, let's, let's intercept it before it gets discharged in mm. the ocean, clean it, we have the technology to do that, and, and reuse it. Reuse it for agriculture, and reuse it in, in appropriate circumstances for drinking as well. That's amazing. Well, why has it been, why has it not been done? It's getting done. It's getting done? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, you also passed city ordinances, like making it illegal for people to excessively water their lawns. Yes. And I'm curious, how does that work in practice? How do you prevent someone from watering oh, their lawn? Right. Do you just shut down their water supply when they exceed a limit or? No. I mean, this this what we did this during my tenure, yeah, and uh, and we were very successful. We caught water consumption by like nineteen percent mm -hmm. uh, during my time. And and uh, and here's how we did it. It wasn't just one approach; mm -hmm. uh, it was a number of approaches. I think maybe four or five approaches. Um, and I'll and I'll tell you which one of these I hope was the most successful mm -hmm. one in in a second, but. The, the, the first thing thing the first thing was a public education campaign right we're all in this together right uh, we're in a drought we have to each one of us has to conserve water we have to not waste water and and I take care of you and you take care of me because we're in this together so yeah a public campaign the second thing was that we deployed uh, um, you know experienced people who went out to all corners of the city mm -hmm. and whenever they saw somebody like washing their car in the in the front yard or something um, or wasting water uh, they had the right they had the right to write tickets but for washing your car <laughs> for wasting water <laughs> yes so but i can't wash my car or <laughs> not no not too much not not during the time that the rest of the city is in a drought you can yeah. take your car to a car wash you can you can you can clean it in a way that that's dry but when but when you've got you've got a situation where we're we're in danger of our water supply not being there no there there's certain things you can't do like restaurants shouldn't just be serving water putting it out and you see go to a restaurant you see half the people don't even drink the water they just That's leave true. these glasses of water sitting on the table you know so so all right the 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 third thing we did was that we passed an ordinance so it was the law that mm -hmm. you can't waste water the mm -hmm. law um, and the fourth thing that we did was that we changed the rates the water rates right so it became more expensive to use water. Your bill wouldn't change if you use less water, but your bill would change if you use the same amount of water. So it's like an exponential thing. Like the more it's well, like look, you it's like it. It's like, listen, if I'm paying uh, a dollar for this glass of water here, right? Mm -hmm. And you change this now to be $2, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If I drink only half, I'm still paying a dollar. Mm -hmm. But if okay. I continue drinking the whole thing, then I'm paying two dollars. Mm -hmm. So, so those were the kind; those were the approaches that we put together. Now, I like to think that the most successful of them was the public education campaign, mm -hmm. but the public outreach campaign. But I know that there are others who will say no. It was the rates, 
raising the rates. I think it must have been the rates. It's always mm-hmm. the money. <laughs> You're so <laughs> cynical. <laughs> <laughs> but then, I mean, w- w- so would you then let people, um, or would you then force people to not water their grass? Or I just can't imagine in my head if I have a garden, do I not just water my plants and yeah. let them die? Yeah. Like that's that's what would happen. Absolutely. And that is and that is what did happen. Yeah. Therefore, what we did was we put that together. We were talking about balancing things, mm-hmm. carrots and sticks. Mm-hmm. So what we did at, at the time, what we put in place was a, uh, a a kind of program under which if you got rid of your thirsty lawn, yeah, which you didn't need, right, and replaced it with artificial turf, mm-hmm. Or replaced it with with drought tolerant, you know, uh, plants mm-hmm. that can be very beautiful. We would actually pay you for that. We would pay you a dollar a foot, and then it became two dollars wow. a foot, and yeah, and that was very. So successful. if I put palms in my garden or cactuses, you would pay me back. Correct. That. Now I don't know that that program is still in place mm-hmm. today. Because we've recently had a lot of rain, and therefore, you know, we don't need the kind of drought measures Policies. that you were just referring yeah. to. But but there there will be another drought around the corner, and therefore, those kinds of measures and those kinds of incentives mm-hmm. and rewards may have to be reintroduced. Or putting fake grass in your garden. Yeah, it's another thing. Astroturf, I see it everywhere. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I have it in my garden. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Time, what time is it? It's uh, 3.58. Okay. You said 4.15? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, so another thing I wanted to touch upon is still with power. Um, there's been a new law affecting the trucking industry, where trucks registered on or after January 1st of this year must have zero emissions. And I spoke with a few farmers that have been affected by this. And they told me they were forced to sell their perfectly working gas-powered vehicles at below market value to states like Nevada, Arizona, you know, Colorado that don't have these policies, or even Mexico. Um, and they were required to purchase these very expensive electric vehicles, which led them to have extremely high costs, and which led to their inability to repair it themselves because there are large companies like D- D- Deer, 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 that have monopolies, yeah, yeah, that have monopolies on the repairs. So these farmers have been extremely negatively affected by this like trucking policy. What do you say to them? They obviously do believe there's climate change, they're affected by droughts, but this specific trucking policy really did have a negative impact on their business. A lot of those, you know, small truckers went out of business, they mm-hmm. had to be rehired by these large companies. Um, and it's it's very difficult to see that. It's very difficult to speak with these people and see how their lives are being ruined mm. no i i uh, uh i i sympathize yeah. i sympathize completely and um and uh you know i that that is not a policy that i'm that i'm that familiar with mm-hmm. in terms of in terms of this uh the trucks um but i i i think this is another example of what we were talking about earlier that if we're going to you see look you know there's no doubt in my mind that having polluting trucks, mm-hmm. both in terms of greenhouse gases and in terms of air pollution, yeah. continuing to operate, that that is a a bad thing that needs to be changed. The the so so the question then becomes: in changing it, um, how do you change it so that you provide people with enough time to adjust to it? And then, and otherwise, and also, in addition, how do you make up for the losses that people are going to suffer? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know enough about the anecdotes that, mm-hmm. that you've been given to comment on that. But it's, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's an argument that you also hear from gas workers. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And last session, Gavin Newsom also proposed a bill which would make the State Department of Water Resources the state's central purchaser of power because the water supply is a, you know, was or is a major generator of electricity and major purchaser. Um, 
citing the need to construct or acquire enough non-polluting generation to meet the state's goal of becoming carbon neutral by 2045. So it would centralize control of our energy sources, which in my opinion would lead to increased prices and stifled competition, which is not great. Um, um, no, I, I don't think that that's what that does. It just empowered the Department of Water Resources to, to purchase power, but it, it cannot centralize the power purchase in, the, in WDR. You've got power purchases, it's actually a very, not a very, but it's mm -hmm. a fairly fragmented uh, landscape because mm -hmm. you've got the, the IOUs that we talked about and then you've got the POUs um, and they're they're all you know purchasing power. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I I think I think empowering DWR to to buy power for its own purposes mm -hmm. um, it is fine, but it doesn't it it doesn't mean that all of a sudden now you've got a monopoly over power purchases. Yeah, I'm especially worried about uh, reliability because we know renewable is not mm. very reliable and we've had a few outages in California, mm. especially during periods of heat where yeah. there's uh, increased use of air conditioning. Um, nuclear, for example, is a good alternative. Nuclear is reliable, it's 100% clean, there's no CO2 emissions and it's affordable. California has one last operating plant, Diablo Canyon in San Luis Obispo. Uh, are you for more nuclear? Do you think California should be building more nuclear? Or do you think we should shut it down? What's your stance on that? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, we talked earlier about the experiment that we're in the middle of in California in terms of, in terms of our energy future. I, um, you know, uh, I'm very much an environmentalist. That's, that's, where, that's the community that I come from. Mm -hmm. but, but I also firmly believe that we cannot afford to fail in this experiment. True. because we want we want the rest of the world to to follow and not failing in this experiment means that we cannot sacrifice reliability yeah so while i know that that many of, of my sisters and brothers in the environmental movement uh, were opposed to to continuing the life of diablo canyon mm -hmm. uh, i support it uh, because I, because I think that uh, that that we need that yeah, that reliability. I agree. So so for instance, many of our coastal gas plants run on on ocean water. They it's it's called once through cooling mm -hmm. or OTC. Mm -hmm. They suck in ocean water in order to cool the plant, the mm -hmm. gas plant, and uh, and the idea was to ban once through cooling because it it kills marine life. But but recently, the governor uh, decided to extend once through cooling for these gas plants so they could continue to operate, and I and I also support that yeah. because uh, because again we need the gas right now while we're continuing to transition to yeah. a new future. Yeah. So I, I I don't think I don't think we can sacrifice a new future, but. But we have to get get there in a way that works. And and yes, right now solar, wind are are intermittent, uh, are, are variable. But we're continuing, I think, to make a lot of strides in energy storage, so that we can harness yeah. the sun and the wind and store that energy. But we're not there yet, where we can be completely um, uh, without these other sources of power yeah so again it's a it's a matter of balance and time and and uh there are a lot of variables making so, making yeah. a successful transition i'm sort of a fan of public private partnerships i mm -hmm. think the private sector can do a great job with innovations mm -hmm. there's a lot of climate tech startups that are working on energy storage and making solar cells more efficient and whatnot. So I really do support lots of investment in these companies. It's definitely worth it. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm privileged to serve on the board of the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Oh, wow, really? And, um, uh, and that's what, the, that's what wow. LACI, or LACI as we call it, does. And it's a, a, a government-funded... How uh, much money does it have? How much money? 
does it have? Does it allocate? It. Oh God, I don't have those numbers, but uh-huh. it, it's been huge. It's been yeah. tens of millions of dollars to 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 many many companies. Mm-hmm. And now, not all of the companies are going to be successful, but but that's what it is with startups. Mm-hmm. It's what an incubator does. So we're doing that in LA for these for these mm-hmm. companies. Um, but again, you know, it takes time for those for those inventions and innovations, for that creativity, that ingenuity, to to have a result. And in the meantime, we have to we have to make sure we have reliability. Hundred percent. Yeah. One more question I had on water. Uh, there's lots of wildfires in the LA area. Where does the water come from to put out the wildfires? Are you using the wastewater or? No, cur- currently there's a whole again this is this is the legacy of cheap <laughs> unlimited water, right? So currently those those water hydrants, those pa- hydrants that yeah. you see on the side of the yeah, that's right now that's all potable water. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was the thought that's of building crazy. out what's called the purple pipe system. Yeah. Um where it would be non-potable yeah. water and and there is that, but but it's not sufficient to deal with the threat of fires everywhere. And salt water is not, you can't do anything with it. I, I, think, I think you can. I, I, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think many of these planes, uh, for instance, will, will take water from reservoirs, which is, which is part of our drinking water supply, and use that water. I haven't yet seen them take water from the ocean. <laughs> And go do that. I haven't. That would be the smartest idea, be, but yeah. <laughs> there must be a reason for it. Yeah, mm-hmm. probably not as effective as drinking water. Yeah. Um, well, my last question is, what does political activism mean to you? What actions can people take to help fight climate change? Well, well, I mean, political activism uh, to me means uh, an, an, uh, an understanding that... Um, um that silence is failure you know so uh, I, I, it's a it's it's a difficult thing for me because i think i think it's it means do you diff- consider yourself an activist I, i do but but i think i'm i'm a very pragmatic mm-hmm. um a very grounded person in terms of my activism You know, I, I don't I don't believe in 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 any kind of violence. I don't believe in in destruction. Um, uh, so, as I say, it means different things to different people. Um, so, so ha- however, I, I don't believe in silence. You know, I believe that that whether you know whatever societal issue one is dealing with, whether yeah. it's whether it's injustice, um, whether it's racism. Um, uh, you know the climate crisis. Uh, you know there there are many societal ills that have to be dealt with, and um, uh, uh, you know and and dedicating oneself to 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 try to at least raise awareness, try to make yeah. some kind of difference to to better to better something. You know it, it doesn't to me. You can be an an activist. Uh, in terms of of animal rights mm-hmm. or or as what I do environmental protection or or seeking you know justice for tribes or we were just in Australia seeking justice for uh, in, indigenous people there um, uh, you know bringing you know I don't know war criminals to to account for what they do fighting mm. fascism fighting authoritarianism <laughs> i mean these are all um you know unfortunately human beings bring with them a lot of a lot of you know bad things uh, yeah. but but also human beings i truly believe also have the capacity to do tremendous good so so just don't be passive i guess That's right. Yeah. And and what can people do on an individual level? You said uh, water conservation. So useless water when you shower, when you water your garden. That's one thing. Useless energy. 
Yeah. I mean, yes, you can, you can, you can kind of privately in your own life walk uh-huh. the walk, right? Yeah, use less water, use less energy. Um, yeah. uh, you know, don't uh, throw trash in the streets. Uh, you know, <laughs> the usual ones. Try to try to you know figure out what your greenhouse gas footprint footprint is, and and so I think there's a lot that you can do like that individually. Um, but when people say to me, you know, what can I do? I I I like I like to advise yes do all of those things that will make you feel a lot better but but also you know join uh, an organization you know people who are interested on in water for mm-hmm. instance there are join water board yeah if, yeah if you can you have to apply and get appointed <laughs> yeah. and then <laughs> if you get appointed you have to get confirmed by this by the California Senate and so on but there are other organizations mm-hmm. like LA Waterkeeper or Heal the Bay um, uh, or, or other environmental organizations like C- Environment California mm-hmm. or the Natural Resources Defense Council. Or there, there are many mm-hmm. of them. Or the Sierra Club or the Los Angeles League of Conservation Voters right here in LA. And they do, they do great work. And, and just, I think for many people, just volunteering to go to their meetings once a week, you know, um, it, uh, uh, it, it really is rewarding because you don't feel alone. You don't feel powerless because you're working with other people. Or I know people that, you know, they do these kind of trash pickups at the beach. Oh, yeah. The Bay does. A lot of people will go do that. They'll yeah. give up a Sunday and go and go do this, you know? So I'll tell you this real quick. So I have two sons and, and when they were, when they were younger, mm-hmm. um, I was on the Heal the Bay board, I, I don't know, so many, many years ago. So I, I decided to go and do this trash pickup and I took my two sons and I said to them, you know what, I'm gonna, you're gonna do something decent today. <laughs> we're gonna go, we're gonna clean up, <laughs> clean up a beach. And, uh, and they said, well, where are we going? And I said, we're going to go to Long Beach. Mm. And my younger son said, great, we're going to go pick up trash on the beach. And my dad couldn't, couldn't pick a short beach. He had to pick a long beach. <laughs> so he thought that <laughs> going to Long have Beach, to do yeah, yeah. Long, so much, yeah. Yeah, well, it's good that you're teaching your children to do these things. I think it's really important. Everyone should get involved. I hope it will do some good. Yeah, thank you so much, David. We really appreciate your yeah, time. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to.